set him in the Nile, and then Pharaoh's daughter saw him, heard the cry, saw the baby, and said, this is one of those Hebrew kids. And she took Moses to be her own son. And his name, Moses, means drawn out of the water, right? And then she hires Moses' own mother, who gets to nurse him until he's weaned, and then she would raise Moses in her own house as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Verse 24, by faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. There were pleasures to be had in Pharaoh's palace that were not available to Hebrew slaves. And Moses had to make a conscious decision to walk away from all of that in order to be identified as one of God's chosen people, which is who he actually was. Verse 26, he considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasure of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. By faith he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. Moses would receive a better education than Aaron. I mean, in a lot of ways, Egyptian society was more advanced in mathematics, agriculture, things like that. So Moses would have been taught things that Aaron never was. On the flip side, Aaron would have been taught about the God of his fathers, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, where Moses probably would not have been educated about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob's God. Instead, Moses would have been raised by his stepmom to worship the gods of Egypt. He would have been taught about the gods of Egypt. Moses would have learned Egyptian as his first language. He would have formally went to school to learn Egyptian, whereas Aaron would grow up and learn Hebrew at home and have to pick up Egyptian as a Hebrew slave. I find this ironic because later, God would call Aaron to speak on Moses' behalf in Egyptian to Pharaoh because Moses stuttered and Aaron didn't, you see. But Moses certainly had it better than Aaron in a lot of ways. Moses would have had a clean-shaven face probably all of his life as Egyptians would shave their face, right? Aaron, from the day he could grow facial hair, never stopped growing facial hair. He would have always had a beard and just have been scruffy. And then Aaron would have never ridden on any animal, not even a donkey, but Moses would have access to not only donkeys, but horses and camels and even chariots. Aaron's hands would have been rough from working either with bricks, making them from mud and straw all day, or maybe doing some other trade as in service to the Egyptians, hard manual labor. Moses' hands would have been soft unless they were callous because he was being trained for war like the Egyptian boys with swords and bows and shields, something that Aaron would never have had access to at all as a slave, Moses would get training in. And so you see the contrast between their two lives growing up could not have been more different growing up as a slave, a Hebrew slave, and growing up in Pharaoh's palace known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Pleasures to be had that Moses would know that Aaron would not. Moses had probably tasted foods, delicacies, that Aaron had never even tasted. Moses had felt softness of material that Aaron would never become accustomed to, like silk and things of this kind of nature that were accessible to Moses in Pharaoh's house. You know, it's interesting. I wonder if when he was growing up, Aaron would have ever pretended that he was Moses. Can you do all the cool things that Moses got to do, running around on chariots and shooting bows and arrows that Aaron never did? I wonder if when Aaron got older, if he resented his brother Moses, his kid brother, for his seemingly better position in life. The Bible never says as much, but it's easy for us to imagine that Aaron might have become jealous of Moses and even may have resented his brother's enviable position in the palace while he and Moses' real family were slaves. The contrast between their two realities was starkly different. Have you ever struggled with comparing yourself to other people? Have you ever been jealous of someone close to you because they seemingly had it better than you? Maybe a family member or even a friend? Have you ever been envious of the opportunities, giftings, and talents that God gave someone else 
Have you ever wished that you could trade places with someone else? I wonder how many of us could relate to Aaron, the older brother of Moses, who, unlike his baby brother, did not enjoy all of the privileges of Pharaoh's palace, but instead was oppressed by it. Aaron would have to work through these issues with God and ultimately choose to not hold these grievances against his brother or against God. If Aaron dealt with these things in his heart, and he may have, he dealt with them by the grace of God so well that the Bible never makes mention of any of them. The Bible never mentions any of this. May God give us the grace that he gave Aaron to deal with our jealousies and insecurities and the fact that we may not have had it as easy as other people as we know, like Aaron did, who though he had plenty of reasons to be bitter, the Bible never mentions that he was. May God give us the same grace that he gave Aaron, the older brother of Moses, who was raised as the son of Pharaoh's daughter in his watching. We all need God to give us the same grace that God gave Aaron, amen? Because life is fair, it's unfair to everyone. Did you know life is fair? It's unfair to everyone. And if we spend our life comparing ourselves to other people's experiences, opportunities, gifts, and talents, and abilities, we will always be able to find someone who we think has it better than us. But different isn't always the better that we imagine it to be. Aaron never had to wrestle with his identity. He would grow up knowing exactly who he was. But Moses would never be able to shake the fact that though he grew up in Pharaoh's palace as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, he knew he didn't belong. His name would be a constant reminder of where he came from, drawn out of the water. It's likely that the Egyptians he grew up with made sure to let Moses know that he wasn't one of them. And if Moses looked for acceptance from the Hebrew boys his own age, there were none. They had all perished in the Nile. Every Hebrew boy was either older or younger than Moses. And they would not likely quickly accept him either. He would have been perceived as the oppressor. It's clear from the story in Exodus that Moses knew he was Hebrew, even though he was raised as an Egyptian, and Aaron never had to sort through that kind of identity crisis that Moses undoubtedly had. So let us remember, and depend on the grace of God that he gave to Aaron, that different isn't always the better that we imagine it to be. But may we accept the grace of God for our unique situation and circumstances, even if it's our own siblings that have such a different set of circumstances than us, even though they grew up with the same parents in the same household. Two people's experience in the same exact set of circumstances can be vastly different, and different isn't always better. This dynamic played out between Moses and Aaron, and it's happened many times before and many times since. Many people have had very different experiences than the people they grew up with, and jealousy and bitterness is a universal problem of the human condition but God gave Aaron grace for this. God gave Aaron grace for this. And God can give us the same grace. You'll never read in your Bible that Aaron resented Moses for being known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. May we not resent people that we think have it better than us when in all reality, it may just be different. The second thing I'd like to point out about Aaron is Aaron was a slave. He was a slave. Aaron lived a long time as a slave in Egypt. How old was Aaron before he was led by the Lord to meet Moses in the desert? Undoubtedly, Aaron lived as a slave in Egypt in excess of 80 years. As we have already heard that he was 83 when his younger brother, who was 80, went to Pharaoh to begin to speak to him. Now, before we go any further, if anyone tells you that you're too old to do something significant for God when you're 80 or older, remind them that Aaron was 83 and Moses was 80 when God called them to start their ministry, right? Senior citizens are not too old to be used by God, amen? <laughs> Caleb was 80 when he took the hill country. 
Abraham was a hundred when he became the father of Isaac. Don't ever allow any whippersnappers to look down on you because you're older than them and never discount how God wants to use any of you at any age of your life. Everyone is young compared to Moses and Aaron, or at least they're contemporary. And you never know, you could be retired from your life's work, and God could call you to start a new ministry like Pastor and Lynette, and you are not too old to serve God. Amen? That's just for free. Aaron was experienced in hard labor. Think about that. Not many easy jobs for slaves. Those are usually taken by Egyptians. Aaron lived a life of hard labor for decades. He had been oppressed in bondage and experienced injustice firsthand. The Bible doesn't tell us anything about Aaron's life as a slave in Egypt. We don't know what he did for his Egyptian masters. Did he make bricks out of mud and straw? Probably. Did he work with metal, perhaps as a blacksmith or a craftsman? Did Aaron used to make idols for the Egyptians? He seemed to have some expertise that we can only assume came from his experience in Egypt when he fashioned the golden calf for the people in the shadow of Mount Sinai. While Moses and Joshua were meeting with God on the mountain, this is what Aaron was doing, Exodus 32, 1 through 5. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, The people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, Up, make us gods who shall go before us. And for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron should have said, Oh, you mean my brother? You mean the guy that God appeared to in the burning bush? You mean the guy that God brought the ten plagues in your sight down on Egypt? Oh, you mean that? that parted the Red Sea and we followed him through it? You mean that guy that introduced us to God on the mountain that spoke the Ten Commandments and then God called him up the mountain after we had dinner with God? That guy, you know what you're going to do? You're going to sit down, you're going to shut up, and you're going to wait on the Lord. That's what Aaron should have done. It was his brother. But listen to what Aaron does. So Aaron said to them, Take off the rings of gold that are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the rings of gold that were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. He received the gold from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made a golden calf. Aaron made the golden calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. Now, we don't know exactly what Aaron did when he was a slave in Egypt, but if you ask me to make a statue for you out of the gold that came off of your ears and your wrists, I don't know what I'm doing. There is no way I could take the gold off of your person put it in fire, melt it down, create a mold for it, and then with a graven tool, form an idol that you would be able to recognize as a calf. If I had made a golden idol out of your gold, you would know it as the golden blob, right? Aaron made it into the golden. Everyone recognized it was a calf. What does this tell us about Aaron? People don't just do this if they've never done it. Aaron had to have some, I just, I can't prove it, but I deduce that he must have had some skills or at least seen it done. And you know what he claims later in the story? That he threw the gold into the fire and outleapt this calf. Well, that was a lie. I don't know what Aaron did, but I suspect that he, um, I think he probably made idols for his former masters in Egypt so that they could worship their false gods. Think about that for a second. Talk about slavery, right? You just don't take metal and melt it down and make an idol with a graven tool if you have no experience. But there's no way to really know. We can be certain that he was a slave. We can be certain about that. And as a slave, we can be sure that his life was hard. 
I don't think the Bible's omission of what Aaron's life was like when he was a slave in Egypt is by accident. I don't think that's by accident. Maybe the details of Aaron's life as a slave are left out because they're not important to the, to the story. I mean, that's probably true, right? But maybe there's a greater reason why the details of Aaron's life as a slave are left out. Because like Aaron, before we were set free by the blood of Jesus, like Aaron and Moses and the rest of the Israelites were set free from their slavery in Egypt by the blood of the Passover lamb, everything we did before we became Christians is all forgiven by the blood of Jesus and the record of all of our sins while we were in our spiritual bondage in Egypt, so to speak. You see, Egypt is a picture of the world and all of us. When before Christ, through faith in his blood, we were in bondage to sin in the world, Egypt is a picture of. And the record of all of our sins before Christ are like Aaron's history as a slave in Egypt, not worth mentioning. Not worth mentioning. Psalm 103, 10 through 12, he does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us, according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. What bonds of sin were you in before you were in Christ? Does it really matter? You are forgiven. And you are not identified by the things you used to do in your past, my friends, your identity is in Christ. Can I get an amen? Praise God. Those sins are no longer counted against you. Your identity is in Christ. In Christ, we're all saved by grace. And the Bible, he does, the Bible doesn't, ref, even though we're sinners, you know what the Bible refers to us as? The Bible calls us saints. Did you know that? Look at your neighbor and say, what's up, saint? You are saints. Like Aaron, it doesn't matter if you used to make bricks from mud and straw. It doesn't even matter if you used to make false idols. It doesn't matter if you served a cruel master. All that matters is that God has chosen you. And he has called you to be a royal priesthood. He has called you to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through faith in Jesus Christ. You see, none of us should marvel that any of us did anything sinful before we were in Christ. That's to be expected. What we should marvel at is that God called sinners to be forgiven by grace through faith in Christ, and he turned former slaves of sin to the world into holy, royal priests who offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, we were all a lot like Aaron. We were all in bondage in Egypt, but God set us free. God set us free. The third point in my message is God set Aaron free. Now, this is a part of one of the most famous stories that for years I have just overlooked. It's always been here. But I just have never noticed it before. But I really have noticed it lately. Exodus 4, 10 through 7, you're going to recognize the story. But Moses said to the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant. But I am now slow of speech and of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seen or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth, and teach you what you shall speak. Did you hear that? First of all, God takes credit for making people with special needs the way that they are. Okay? Did you hear that? God is the one who makes the mute, the blind, the deaf, the lame. And if God made people with these disabilities, you know what that means? God has a purpose for people with disabilities. Amen? And that's one of the things I love about Safe Harbor Homes and Services just because a person has less ability does not mean they deserve less love or care from the church or from the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? God bless Safe Harbor. Praise God. Praise God. 
But then he tells them, hey, I'm going to teach you how to speak. And God offers to help Moses with his speech impediment. Great, right? You think if you're Moses, this is like the answer to prayer. But listen to Moses' answer. But he said, oh, my Lord, please send someone else. Have, have you ever had God ask you to do something and your answer is, please not me? You know, please someone else. That's, that's, that's what Moses does. He says, no, I don't want to do it. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? And if you're Moses, you're probably thinking, yeah, he's in Egypt. I haven't seen him in 40 years. Last time I checked... He's a Levite, but he's also a slave. And you know what? What does it matter that he's a Levite? See, we read that statement, and we know that God chooses the Levites to be priests, right? But when God made this statement to Moses, he had not revealed to anyone that the Levites were chosen to be priests. And so when God makes this statement, it just seems kind of to Moses like, yeah, I do have a brother named Aaron, Back in Egypt, in case you hadn't noticed, God, we're at Mount Horeb. Egypt's a long ways away, and he's a slave. So what? Now listen to this. It says, is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you. And when he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. Aaron's coming here. Aaron's a slave in Egypt. Pharaoh does not let slaves go easily. How is it that Aaron walks out of Egypt all the way to Mount Horeb, which is the same as Mount Sinai, okay? The place where God would give the Ten Commandments to the people of Israel. Aaron just happens to be on his way out of Egypt where he was a slave, and is now all the way out in the wilderness on the west side of the wilderness from Midian's perspective? I mean, the obvious answer is God set Aaron free. Amen? God, how did Aaron get out of Egypt? Did he have to escape? Did he sneak out in the middle of the night? Did he hide under a, a cart filled with straw when it was carried out, right? We have no idea. Is it just the fact that he was 80 plus years old and after a certain point the Egyptian taskmasters were like you really can't keep up so we really don't care what you do and they just let him go because he had kind of aged out of useful service here's the beautiful thing we don't know all we know for certain is that God set Aaron free and he's all the way at Sinai and he just happens to walk up to Moses the same day on the same mountain where God's meeting him out of the burning bush. Talk about timing that only God could pull off, right? I mean, that is timing that only God could pull off. And can you imagine Aaron, it says he's going to be glad to see you. He doesn't resent you in his heart because you grew up known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Aaron may not have even known that Moses was alive. They didn't have cell phones back then. Even if you had a cell phone, I'll bet you don't get reception at Mount Sinai today. My friends, there is no reception out there. There's no telegrams. There's no emails. There's no physical mail. They're not sending even so much as a hawk with a little note to Egypt and back to each other. It's just not happening. There's no way of even knowing if the other is alive. And Aaron walks up under the direction of the Holy Spirit, and there's his brother who's just encountered God in the burning bush, and Aaron is a free man. Can you imagine you've been a slave for 80 years and you're out in the middle of the wilderness and there are no Egyptian soldiers asking you where you're going and what you're doing and you're just free and you're just out there like, yeah, I am free, man. I can go wherever I want. I can do whatever I want. And you're being led. You're being led by the Spirit deeper and deeper. And all of a sudden, there's this guy who looks vaguely familiar and you go, Moses? Is that you? And for, you realize for the first time, maybe in the next last 40 years, that your brother's actually alive. 
And then he starts telling you about how he met God out of a burning bush. And you're so excited. And then, you know what he says to you? We're going back to Egypt. Why? Why would we go back to Egypt? I just left Egypt. I was a slave and now I'm free. But see, this time it was going to be different. God was sending Moses and Aaron back to Egypt, not as slaves, not as captives, but as liberators. And they were going back to set God's people free. And my friends, we are all like Aaron because we have all been slaves in Egypt and God has set us free. And you know what God calls us to do after he sets us free? He sends us back to people in Egypt so that we can set them free too by telling them about the God who met us on the mountain. Can I get an amen? You see, we are a lot like Aaron. We're a lot like Aaron. You are called a royal and a holy priesthood. And my friends, your life in Christ is so much more significant than just taking care of yourself and the people that you care about. God has called you and given you the ministry of reconciliation that you can go to the people in slavery in Egypt and tell them how they can be free through faith in Jesus Christ. God has called you to the highest job that anyone could be called to, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And you're just like Aaron. You don't deserve it. You're not worthy. But God chose you anyways. And you know what? He gives you grace upon grace upon grace. And he calls people who are sinful to offer holy spiritual sacrifices of praise and worship unto our God. Who are we that God has chosen us to be a chosen people, a royal priesthood. You know what we're going to find as we go through this series and we study Aaron's life? Is that God did for us what he did for Aaron. That he gave us grace upon grace. And he called us in spite of all of our disqualifications and shortcomings. And he uses us anyways. My friends... Could we stand to our feet right now and offer God some acceptable sacrifice of praise through our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ?
My friends, we should not take life for granted. You know, eternity is closer than any of us would like to comfortably think about. You could just eat a piece of bread that gets stuck in your throat, and next thing you know, you're going to be standing before the presence of Almighty God. People don't ever plan to die, but sometimes people do. And unless you deal with your sin on this side of life, when you get to eternity, it will be too late. So my friend, if you have not prayed to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you need to do so with urgency even today. For today is the day of salvation. And none of us are guaranteed even this afternoon. And so my friend, if you have not prayed to ask Jesus to forgive you for your sins and to accept him as your Lord and Savior, I urge you, to pray this prayer along with me and along with the church and accept Christ because life is short but eternity is long and if you want to know where you're going if you want to go to heaven Jesus said he is the way the truth and the life in John chapter 14 verse 6 and that no one goes to the Father except through him Jesus is the only way of salvation and the only way to heaven and if you have not accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you are taking crazy chances with your eternity that you need to not take. So if you're here today or you're watching online and you have never prayed to accept Christ or there's something going on in your life where you need to rededicate, I urge you with the urgency of the reminder that was given to me outside of this sanctuary a little bit earlier that life can be taken from you like that. So get right with God while you still have opportunity to do so. Let's pray, shall we? Church, would you repeat this prayer after me? And if that's you and you need to get right with God right now, you repeat this prayer along with us. And don't pray to me. Don't pray to the TV. Pray to God. And God who's in heaven will hear you here on earth. Church, can we say this prayer together? Say, dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. And I believe you're the son of God that you were born to the Virgin Mary and proved you were God's son by doing things that only God could do. Healing the sick, raising the dead, walking on water. And at the end of your life, you sacrificed yourself, dying on the cross to pay for the sins of the world, my sins included. You died. You were buried, but on the third day, the power of the Holy Spirit resurrected you from the dead, and today I believe you're alive. I believe you're in heaven, praying for me. You see my life. So I confess to you, but you already know that I have sinned, and I am sorry, Lord, for all of my sins. I don't want to live like that anymore, but from this day forward, I want to start living for you. I believe and I receive your grace by faith this morning. I love you, Jesus. I confess with my mouth that Jesus, you are my Lord. And I believe in my heart that as God raised you from the dead, that you are my savior. Jesus, because you died for me and rose from the dead, I choose to live for you. Today, for the rest of my days, and for all eternity, I am yours. In Jesus' name I pray. And all of God's people said, amen, amen. Can we give the Lord a clap offering right now? God is so good. If you're here today, and you prayed to receive Christ or rededicate your life to Christ, I urge you, please come and see me or Pastor Poncho after the service. We would love to talk with you. Or you can come down and pray with one of the prayer altar workers. The altar is going to be open. If you need prayer for anything, come on down. We would love to pray for you and see what God can do in your life. If you're online or you're here and you've got to go, you can let us know that you prayed to receive Christ by texting the word LIFE to 925-934-3056. Just text the word LIFE 
to 925-934-3056 and let us know that you prayed to receive Christ. We want to celebrate with you. We want to pray for you. We'd like to get in contact with you to encourage you in your walk with the Lord. For the rest of us who are here today, you are a royal priesthood. You are a chosen people. And I want to pray that God would give you the grace to perform the spiritual duties that he's called you to, to offer spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable to God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I pray for you to close the service? Heavenly Father, these are your chosen people. They are chosen by you because they chose to put their faith in your son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, you have given them grace. And I pray that you would give them more grace. And after that, you would give them more grace. And that you would give them grace upon grace to be able to offer the spiritual sacrifices that are acceptable unto you through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Equip your priesthood, I pray, with the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus. Lord, I pray you would bless them and you would keep them and you would make your face to shine upon them. And then when you look at them, that you would give them peace. In the matchless name of Jesus, we pray. And all of God's people said, amen. God bless you richly. The altars are open if you need prayer. Pastor Matthews Lynette will be outside. Pick up some tickets for the Memorial Day picnic. Have a great rest of your day.